Hi, I'm Beth Wiggins. When we held a workshop at the FJC on Chapter 9 bankruptcy in late 2016, many of the participants highlighted the need for judges handling Chapter 9 cases to understand the intricacies of municipal finance. We're fortunate to have one of those participants, Lawrence LaRose, guide us through the important issues today. Lawrence is a partner in Norton Rose Fulbright, based in New York City, and leads their municipal restructuring practice. He's played a major role in nearly every significant Chapter 9 case in recent memory, including Detroit, Jefferson County, Alabama, Stockton, San Bernardino, and Vallejo. And he's been named a leading lawyer in this area by the Legal 500 every year for the past five years. Larry, welcome, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Beth. Thrilled to be here. Thanks. So to start, can you tell me what the most significant difference between corporate finance and municipal finance is in the bankruptcy world? Sure. In my view, Beth, the most significant distinction is between secured obligations and unsecured obligations. In the corporate world and in the Chapter 11 world, that distinction is fairly clear, well-developed, and understood. Unfortunately, in the municipal finance world, the distinction is much murkier. Now, for decades, the gold standard in muni finance, that is, the obligation that's considered the safest and most secure, has been called the general obligation bond, sometimes the GO bond. With a GO bond, a municipality pledges its full faith and credit and full taxing power to the repayment of the obligation. Thus, it's argued uh, that those bonds have a first call on all the tax receipts of the municipality of the municipality and therefore should be senior to other municipal obligations in bankruptcy. Now, Chapter 9 incorporates the priority and security provisions of Chapter 11. So the question is whether a GO pledge of full faith and credit and taxing power creates a lien under the code. So what does the code and the case law tell us about that? Well, the definition of lien, which is found in Section 10137 of the code is incorporated into Chapter 9. And it states in general terms that a lien is a charge against or an interest in property to secure repayment of a debt or performance of an obligation. Now, just going to basics, Black's Law Dictionary tells us that a pledge is defined as the act of providing something as security for a debt or obligation. So the argument goes that a GO pledge is intended to provide security for the repayment of the GO bond and therefore constitutes a lien under 10137. So what's a counter argument to that? Well, on the other side, it's argued that because the GO pledge of full faith and credit and taxing power doesn't relate to property, because that property doesn't exist when the pledge is made, it doesn't satisfy the definition of 10137, and therefore a GO pledge is just an unsecured obligation of the municipality. Now, these issues have been fully briefed but never decided. They were very contentious in the Detroit case. Uh, there was oral argument heard, briefs were filed, but the issue was ultimately settled without a judicial decision. So we have a fundamental aspect of municipal finance, that's the priority of GO bonds, that is, has not been definitively settled with judicial precedent. Okay, so are there different types of GO bonds and do the intricacies of the different issuances have an impact for bankruptcy? Yeah, there sure are. Uh, Beth, there are a number of flavors of GO bonds. Some GO bonds pledge the full and unlimited taxing power of the municipality. Those are called unlimited GO bonds. Some pledges are limited to, to rates or amounts, and those are called limited general obligation bonds, and they're generally considered to be subordinate to general obligation bonds, the unlimited general obligation bonds. Other types of GO bonds have multiple pledges. They'll have a full faith and credit pledge, but they also may have a pledge of a specific revenue stream, a specific tax or a specific other specific source of revenues, and these are called double barrel bonds and they'll have multiple pledges, and the question is what will be the rank and priority of each of those pledges. Now, the specific terms of any of these types of obligations are defined in the bond indenture, uh, the 
resolution approving uh, the bond issuance and applicable state and local law, all of which have to be looked at very carefully uh, to determine the questions we're talking about. Quickly gets very complicated. It I'm sure does. Okay. So what's the difference between a general obligation bond and a revenue bond? Okay. In contrast to the general obligation mm -hmm. bond, a revenue bond is supported by specific revenues that are generated by a project or a specific tax or some other revenue source of the municipality without recourse to the general fund. So a typical example of that uh, would be a bond supported by a utility, mm -hmm. uh, water system or electric system, um, a transit system, sales tax bonds, uh, or bonds supported by state aid. Now, they, these are all types of specific revenues that are pledged to the bonds. Okay, so how does the code treat those kinds of bonds? Okay, well, because these are ongoing revenue streams uh, that are pledged for payment of the bonds, uh, we have something called Section 552A of the code, uh, which is incorporated into Chapter 9. And in the, in the case of revenue bonds, it creates something of an issue. Well, the revenue themselves are, have liens on them, and those liens are fairly clear. Section 552A says that property acquired by the debtor after the commencement of the case that is subject to a lien resulting from a, a security agreement before the commencement of the case is not part of the lien after commencement of the case. But then we have Section 928, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what happened is 552A was so confusing to the municipal market. Okay. Uh, and caused the municipal market to question whether revenues uh, acquired after the commencement of the case would be subject to the liens that Congress in 1988 had to amend the code. Okay. Now, it took them 50 years to do this, but they finally got around to it in 1988. And in 1988, they inserted Section 928 of the code. So Section 928 of the code essentially says, notwithstanding Section 552A, forget about it for this purpose, special revenues mm -hmm. acquired after the commencement of the case are still subject to the lien. Okay, so now I have to ask you another question, and that is what are special revenues? That's a good one. So special revenues are specifically defined as part of this 1988 amendment, and they're defined in section 9022, subsections A through E. And the definition generally encompasses revenues that are generated from what they call projects or systems of the debtor that are used primarily for public services. Okay? They also are defined as specific taxes and various other types of revenues that are derived from functions of the city. Okay? So what's the importance of this definition for the bankruptcy analysis? Yeah, well, it's centrally important because uh, under Section 928A, the liens that are granted on special revenues as defined are not cut off under 552A uh, and the automatic stay under Section 362 does not apply. Okay. Are there other limitations to the application of Section 552A that are important in the Chapter 9 context? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, because 552A by its terms only applies to liens that are created by a security agreement, i.e. by a contract uh, between parties, it doesn't apply to liens that are created solely by a statute. And such liens continue after the filing of the petition. Now, it's important to note that statutory liens are liens that arise automatically uh, by the force of law and are not based on any agreements between the parties, either contract uh, agreements or judi judicial action. Now, the interplay between the relevant statutory language and any financing documents that are involved in an obligation supported by a statutory lien are very important. It's an important dynamic that was litigated extensively uh, by both the Bankruptcy Court and the District Court in the Orange County cases, and we do have some learning on it. Uh, but suffice it to say that the more explicit the statutory language is that creates the liens and the more automatic that the lien is in the statute, the more likely it is to be enforced as a statutory lien. Okay, so let me see if I can summarize this. So is it right that if statutory lien, 
bonds based on statutory liens or pledge special revenues continue to be paid during the pendency of the bankruptcy case, of course, according to their terms, and of course, to the extent of the pledge special revenues? Well, not necessarily. Um, code mm -hmm. section 922D, uh, which applies, which is an exception to the automatic stay, it only applies to pledged special revenues and doesn't apply to statutory liens. And so property that is subject to a statutory lien does not have that exception. And so with respect to special revenues, code section 928B creates a carve out for the lien. It, it essentially says any, any lien on special revenues uh, that is derived from a project or a system, like mm -hmm. a water system or an electrical system, is subject to the necessary operating expenses of the project or system, as the case may be. Now, the legislative history of the 1988 amendments suggests that that 928B carve-out was meant to protect gross liens, meaning a lien that was on all the revenues of the project from depriving the project of operating expenses during the pendency of the case was not n meant to be applied to net liens which, which attach to revenues after payment of operating expenses. Nevertheless, this issue was litigated extensively in the Jefferson County Chapter 9 cases. Uh, and in that case, the bankruptcy judge uh, determined that the definition of operating revenues for 928B purposes is essentially the definition in the indenture that was a net lien case, and he didn't modify it for 928, but it's an open issue. Okay, so can you tell me more about statutory liens on non-special revenue property? Yeah, sure. Now, holders of statutory liens on non-special rep revenue property, in order to get access to the revenues during the pendency of the case, they have to file a motion to lift the automatic stay under 362, and they have to file a motion to lift the stay for cause. Now, there's no case law, none, specifically addressing adequate protection or what constitutes cause for this purpose. Uh, and analogous provisions of Chapter 11 and the Chapter 11 case law on adequate protection can be easily distinguished uh, in the Chapter 9 context. Now, recent litigation in the Puerto Rico cases uh, under PROMESA, the new bankruptcy law that applies only to Puerto Rico, suggests that bondholders have the burden of proof to show that they are not adequately protected and therefore need to lift the stay. But it's unclear whether those PROMESA cases would apply in Chapter 9. Okay. Well, let's move on to a different issue. Sure. Um, can we talk a little bit about the differences between creditor constituencies in Chapter 9 cases versus um, Chapter 11 cases? Yeah, that, that's another good question. Uh, the most obvious difference uh, would be the lack of creditor committees in Chapter 9 mm -hmm. cases. Um, now, it's not that the code doesn't permit them. It does. Section 1102 and 1103 are incorporated into Chapter 9. The reason you generally don't see creditor committees is because there's no provision and the court cannot force a municipal debtor to pay the fees and expenses of a committee. So generally they are informed. The exception to that uh, in major cases are retiree committees. We had retiree committees that were formed in both the Stockton cases and the Detroit case. Uh, they played major roles, but those were formed with the consent of the debtor and the debtor consented to pay their reasonable fees and expenses during the case. I'd like to talk about some of those issues at a later date, but let's move on. What about trustees? Ah, well, trustees uh, are interesting as well. Code section 1104 is not applicable in Chapter 9 explicitly, so the court has no authority to appoint a trustee or a receiver. They also cannot uh, 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 appoint an examiner uh, uh, in the case. So traditionally, the rights of bondholders uh, in Chapter 9 cases have been left to be protected by indenture trustees uh, or the like. Uh, although many types of municipal bonds, I have to tell you, including particularly including GOs, don't have indenture trustees. They have fiscal agents, which can sometimes be the city themselves. So in many cases, the bondholders are left to fend for themselves. Okay, so what does the presence or, of bond insurance have to do with the case? Well, bond insurance is, is a unique aspect of municipal finance. Uh, <coughs> bond insurance uh, uh, it, it, it are insurance companies that insure the payment of principal and interest when due on municipal bonds. Uh, generally, financial guarantee policies 
obligate the insurer to pay when due, but not upon acceleration. Uh, and they, they, they therefore mean that the bond insurer are in the case for the full case. They can't trade themselves out of the case. Uh, and they, they, under the bond documents, generally step into the shoes of the bondholders to enforce their rights and even for voting provisions under the code. And so bond insurers can and in fact have played major roles uh, in most of, ch of the larger chapter nines. Okay. So special revenue bonds clearly have a unique status in chapter nine. Yes. Um, what about the confirmation process? How are they treated or to be treated in the plan of adjustment? Yeah. So towards the end of the case, when it comes to confirmation, the question of whether special revenue claims can be impaired without the consent of the bondholders, a cram down mm -hmm. under, under 1129B, it's hotly debated. Uh, and we don't have judicial resolution yet. It is clear that 1129B generally applies to Chapter 9, uh, but its application to special revenue claims is very difficult because there's a real difficulty uh, in valuing revenue streams, and of course we can't force the municipality to liquidate its assets. Um, so you have valuation issues. Um, the debtor in Detroit attempted to cram down on its special revenue obligations. Uh, they, they, they proposed a plan uh, that uh, would have imposed uh, principal and principal haircuts uh, and interest haircuts uh, on the bonds. They based the interest cut on a till market base analysis under the Supreme Court uh, case, even though in that case all parties agreed that the special revenues available were more than sufficient to service the bonds in full. Okay. So what happened? Well, it was hotly contested. Uh, the parties fully briefed the issues, uh, and uh, those briefs are very instructive. They're still on the public record. Uh, but no judicial resolution came out of, <laughs> out of that, uh, uh, that debate, uh, because eventually uh, Detroit amended its plan of adjustment to pay the bonds, the, those special revenue bonds in full through a refinancing. So what do you think should happen? My personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Uh, is that in a case where sp special revenues are sufficient to pay the bonds and the claims in full, neither a cram down under 1129B nor a market interest rate adjustment under TIL is permissible because the lien on the special revenues, as we discussed before, attaches to every dollar of the revenues as they are collected during the case. And nothing under the code, under the, under the case law, or even the su plurality Supreme Court opinion in TIL permits or condones an impairment of a live lien. Okay. And remember, special revenues have a live lien during the case. So it's going to be pretty interesting to see how that's put forth and resolved in future cases. It sure will. Okay. So what other unique aspects of municipal finance do you think are important in the Chapter 9 context? Yeah. Uh, the state laws uh, generally apply, okay, during, mm -hmm. during the Chapter 9 case. And the laws that that establish restricted funds, sometimes they're called enterprise funds uh, or limited use funds, uh, they remain applicable. And that means that those funds uh, must be maintained separate from uh, the uh, uh, general obligations mm -hmm. of the city and aren't available for creditors. Um, so that's a distinction. Uh, in other cases, there may be things called intercept laws uh, that have uh, been implicated in bond issues. Under an intercept statute, um, a revenue source that is other otherwise being paid to a city, say um, uh, fees or, or state aid, uh, <coughs> upon a certain trigger, whether it's default or in insolvencies, that revenue stream is automatically redirected to be paid directly to the bondholders. Now, the enforceability of intercept laws uh, under Chapter 9 is, again, uh, subject to uh, debate. Uh, it was litigated in the Vallejo case, uh, but um, not to a conclusion, surprisingly. Uh, but suffice it to say that the more automatic uh, the trigger uh, and the, uh, the less need for third-party action, the more likely the intercept is to be enforced. So you've outlined um, for us many interesting issues that actually haven't been resolved at the bankruptcy court or the district court, much less the court of appeals that would create some binding precedent. Right. Um, you mentioned Puerto Rico and PROMESA earlier. 
What effect do you think the litigation in those cases is going to have on restru municipality restructuring and Chapter 9 generally? Yeah, look, I, I think it's difficult to say. Um, it, it's true that the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico and various of its public instrumentalities, they used virtually every municipal finance structure known and, and sometimes unique ones to Puerto Rico to finance their obligations over many years. And many of those structures are being tested uh, currently in the Puerto Rico bankruptcy cases. We call them bankruptcy mm -hmm. cases even though they're not. Uh, but in my view, the wider impact of rulings in those Puerto Rico cases uh, is really unknown. And I think we need to be cautious about drawing parallels between Chapter 9 uh, and the PROMESA cases for a number of reasons. Um, first, PROMESA is a unique federal statute that currently applies only to Puerto Rico. And it was implemented under the territorial clause of the Constitution, not the bankruptcy clause. Now, we call the Title III cases bankruptcy-like cases, but they are not bankruptcy cases under the code. In fact, they're in the district court. They're not in the bankruptcy court. Secondly, uh, while PROMESA does incorporate many provisions of both Chapter 9 and Chapter 11, including many of the things we've discussed today, it also has many other unique provisions, and those unique provisions need to be taken into account when interpreting the statute. Um, third, I don't think it can be ignored that the entire Puerto Rico situation is rife with politics. And in addition to that, the uh, unexpected humanitarian disasters of the hurricanes has put a patina over those cases, which makes them completely unique. And I think it's fair to say may have some bearing on the outcomes in those cases. So finally, the district court in Puerto Rico, uh, in one of the early PROMESA cases, that's before they file for Title III, um, when that court was interpreting concepts under Chapter 11 and Chapter 9, that court cautioned that jurisprudence from Chapter 11 can't be applied directly under PROMISA because of the unique circumstances of the statute. So the reverse may also be true. So we need to be very cautious, something we may want to revisit in a year or two. That'll be a fun conversation. Maybe some more development in the Chapter 9 context and development in the PROMISA cases, right. and we'll have a good discussion. Um, so for now, what I'd like to do is, can you tell me in a nutshell what the major takeaways from our discussion today are. What would you like to leave judges with? Sure. Um, look, I think, as we've talked about, the, the interface between municipal finance and bankruptcy is a difficult one. Um, the, the parameters of, uh, of the issues we've talked about are, have been fairly drawn out, uh, but the details have yet to be determined. And so I think practitioners and judges need to be very careful about the facts and circumstances of their individual cases uh, in order uh, to determine those cases in the most fair and equitable ways while waiting for the law to develop. That's going to be really fun to talk about in a few years. And I'm, but for today, thank you so much for being here again and um, really appreciate it. Thank you, Beth. My pleasure.